so um, I'm a biologist, just so you know before I start, I'm not going to put any equations up. <laughs> um, so, and I'm interested in how cells get out of blood vessels. So I'm interested, and what we're studying is how cells in the blood vessels, which can be cancer cells or leukocytes, attach to the blood vessel walls, so how they attach, and then how they cross um, the endothelial cells lining the blood vessel wall. And the models that we've been using recently are primary T cells, so, and these are all human, and, and T cell leukemias and prostate and breast cancer cells, just to put into perspective. So, um, and what we work on is intracellular signal transduction. So what happens inside the cells to allow the cells to, one, attach, and two, cross the endothelium. And we work on this family of proteins called the Rho family. Um, there are 20 human genes, uh, and uh, the first were cloned in 1985, these three, Rho A, Rho B, and Rho C, so hence the name is Rho, because they, they, that comes from this. It actually stands for RAS homolog, so they were cloned because they were homologous to RAS, and uh, which was known to be uh, a can an oncogene in cancer. So today I'm going to be talking about um, our efforts to study, oh, the, and there's another protein I'm specifically going to be talking about, which in contrast to the rest of them has a silly name called CD42. The rest begin with R, <laughs> so it's easy, but this is a yeast cell cycle mutant that was originally identified in yeast, so it has this yeast name. So it's confusing because it doesn't begin with R. Okay. So um, I want to put these proteins into where they are in the cells for people who are physicists and computational so you understand what they're doing. So they're involved in signaling in cell migration. And when we consider cell migration, we have receptors on the cell surface that stimulate signals inside the cell. So particularly for leukocytes, we might be thinking about integrins, which binds um, to the uh, endothelium. And then inside the cell, you have these proteins called signal transducers that get activated in response to these receptors. And the particular ones I'm going to be talking about are these ones, which are GTPases. And, and the ultimate aim of all these signaling uh, molecules is to change cell migration. So, and this involves changes to actin, um, polymerization, microtubules, and cell adhesions to allow the cells to move. And this is where we come in because we focus in this area, the signal transducers, um, and how they transmit the signal from outside the cell from the receptors to the cytoskeleton and cell adhesion so the cell can move. Okay, and this row family is part of this signaling network. So what we've done um, in two different models I'm going to describe today is we've done a, sorry, I'm sorry about the capital I, um, it's an RNAi screen. So what we do is we use, um, does everyone know what RNAi is? No? <laughs> okay. So what we do is we basically silence each of these genes by putting inside the cells um, a small length of RNA which binds to the message that codes for the protein. So you have the DNA and then you have the message which is the mess uh, which is the M RNA, and we make uh, RNA that's complementary to the RNA, and that targets the RNA for degradation. So, um, so we can do that selectively for each gene because they all have different RNA sequences. And we can choose RNAs that will just target each of these uh, 20 members. And the idea is to find out which of these 20 members is really important for each step um, in T cells and cancer cells. So, um, and the assay we did for T cells, where we add t, t cells um, to uh, a layer of endothelial cells, so there's no flow here. This is purely to do the screen to, to, to identify um, the candidates, which we can then pursue in more detail. And we put under here something that attracts a small uh, molecule that attracts the T cells to go through this. Um, this is just a cross section to show you that you. Basically, you've got liquid here and liquid here. You add the T cells on the top. Here's it. The blue is the endothelial cells, and the, and the T cells cross the endothelial cells and accumulate in here. And then we can count how many T cells there are in here and work out how many have gone through. And what we do is in the T cells, we use this method to 
silence each of these genes and then see if it affects the ability of them to go through the endothelial cells. This is the result. So um, for um, each of the genes, and <coughs> what um, we found out was this particular one, so this is a control where we haven't depleted any of the genes, and these are all the different um, genes. And it's this one here, row A, that had the strongest and most significant effect. So there are other ones that have an effect as well, so I'm not ruling out other ones, but this had the strongest um, effect on, on the ability of the T cells to transmigrate. So then we studied this one, row A, in more detail. And um, this is, these are going to be movies where these are the endothelial cells here, and these are the T cells that we've added at the beginning here. And if you look at the um, controlled uh, cells, what the T cells do is once they attach, some of them just sit there and try and cross, but uh, you can see some of them migrate like crazy on the top of the endothelium. And that's because they they're actually love to migrate on the surface. <laughs> um, and eventually they'll stop and find a site where they'll transmigrate. But they, they tend to migrate a lot on the surface before they cross. Um, but so you, see that you can see there are two phenotypes here. There's the ones that um, sit and are trying to cross and the ones that are migrating. So there are these kind of round cells and then these cells which are moving and exploring the surface. And then when we knock down row A, which is the one that was the strongest phenotype, um, it, it has a completely different effect on the cells. For a start, you can see there's no cells moving there, really. Not very much. They're not going like crazy across the surface. And nearly all of them um, have two protrusions, like this one is a classic example, where this, the nucleus is in the middle and they <coughs> extend two very thin protrusions like this at either side, between uh, on the other side of the nucleus. And so they, they are physically unable <laughs> to cross the endothelium because... They're not, they might manage to get a little bit through um, a junction, but they can't actually get the whole way across. Okay, so um, because this work is already published on row A, I'm just going to summarize what happens here. So if you add a, a T cell, which is normally unpolarized relatively, and it's not moving, in, it's in suspension, to endothelial cells, the um, thing that happens is that um, mostly... Most of them then form this polarized migration, migratory structure where they're moving in this direction, in the arrow, and this front is driven by actin polymerization, and the back is contractile. So it's like uh, acting like a toothpaste tube, squeezing on it from the back, and this is actively protruding at the front, and together you need both for the cell to move. And what we've shown is that row A is actually required both at the back and the front, and that's why the cells can't move, because at the, at the back it's stimulating this contractility. So if you get rid of row A, then the, the back is no longer exists because there's no con contraction at the back, and so it just becomes floppy. Um, and then at the front, row A is also required for this protrusion at the front. So um, if you can't have row A here, then you can't protrude either. So you just end up with these cells with these two thin protrusions, but they're, they're not actually moving positively in any direction because they've lost their back and front, basically. Okay, so um, that was about the T cells. I'm now going to talk more about uh, prostate and breast cancer cells, but particularly prostate cancer cells. So... Um, in these cells, what we did was the same thing. We used this RNAi technique to knock down the um, expression of each of the 20 um, row proteins in the cells. And we used a, a cancer cell line, PC3, prostate cancer cells. But in this model, we actually just measure adhesion. So initially, we were interested in what regulates the ability of the cancer cells to attach to the endothelium. And... Um, so we're not doing transmigration initially. We're just looking at their ability to attach. And again, uh, actually here, we had quite a number that affected attachment. So we had eight, the ones in red, affected attachment. So if we wanted to really dissect something to do with attachment, we then decided, well, 
Okay, so there are eight that have an effect, so we're going to pursue these all in a little bit, bit more detail. And what we did was to make movies using the same conditions where we add, we have the endothelial cells and we add the cancer cells um, and made movies to see which ones had the strongest effect morphologically on the endothelial cells that we could pursue from the eight that had a adhesion defect. So um, I should point out that the adhesion is done at 15 minutes after adding the cancer cells, so um, it's quite early, uh, whereas um, the movies are, are more long-term. They go for about five hours. So you could, you could argue you have an initial de adhesion defect, but then subsequently you can overcome it and, uh, and the cells are dear, and then they can actually cross the spine in the end. So you might reduce adhesion, but that's not really going to... That's just going to slow the whole process down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the unattached cells, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so we knocked down... This is just example movies. So um, uh, in every case, the control cells, we mix the two. So we mix the control cells, which are in blue, with the cells that we've manipulated to... To n reduce the levels of row A, RAC1, and CD42 in this case, which are green. So, this is really nice because we can look at them both at the same time in each and, and compare the populations. So, um, what you'll see is, I mean, they, they attach, we, we measure the attachment at 15 minutes, but each cell individually, it can be a long time before they um, start to go into the endothelium. And what you'll see, if you look at the control cells first, so here, um, they insert into the endothelium and they just move around with the endothelial cells, which are also moving around a lot, actually. Um, and they move around in the endothelium. Now, they're, they're stuck on glass, so they can't get through. Um, if we set up a 3D system, they would go through. But um, in this situation, we're just trying to see if there's a difference between the cells under the different conditions. And... Um, from doing this, we could say that this one, CDC42, had the strongest effect. So although the other cells, like the row A, the ones lacking row A, RAC1, they had a delay in adhesion, ultimately they could sit down and become part of the endothelial monolayer like the control cells. But the CDC42 depleted cells, you can see here these green ones, they're still round on the top. They haven't flattened out. And, and the way we can tell is because the flattened out cells, you can see the nucleus here, right there, there, and there. But these cells are still round on the top. So they've never managed to become part of the endothelium. So because of that, we decided to follow up on CDC42. And um, Nico Raymond, who was doing this work, tracked loads and loads of movies. <laughs> cells in the movies, um, to see at what time they carry out this step of becoming part of the, of spreading between endothelial cells and becoming part of the endothelium. And you see, even at, at 30 minutes, actually about 40% of the cells have already done it. Um, by uh, six hours, um, nearly 100% of the normal cells have done it. But if we if we reduce the level of CDC42 protein in the cells, this is really dramatically reduced. So at 30 minutes, you know, you just, none of them have done it, <laughs> hardly. Um, and it, although they pick up, uh, it's still much lower than these cells. And I should point out that even though they might have um, sat down in the monolayer of endothelial cells, they still look different. These CDC42 depleted cells are still more rounded. Um, okay, so... So then, so then what we did was actually to look at what they look like in vivo. And to do this, what we do is to inject these same cancer cells into the tail vein of mice. And they go around in the circulation, they come out into the lung, and they get stuck in the lung. And we image them in, in the lung. So these are the blood vessels in red, um, and we're using... Um, an antibody to an endothelial surface protein so we can see the blood vessels. And you can see in the lung there, there are lo loads of blood vessels. And they're all quite small. These are capillaries. So um, what you can see is that 
um, 10 minutes after injecting the cancer cells, we can actually, but by the time you've dissected out the lung and imaged it, it takes 10 minutes. <laughs> you inject the cancer cells and, and um, dissect out the lung and look at their morphology. What we can see is that the control cells in the capillaries extend these protrusions like this. So they seem to be interacting productively with the capillary wall. So they're like extending out, um, sampling the environment. In these conditions, it takes ages for these cancer cells to get across the endothelium in vivo. So um, even by 24 hours, you won't have very many of them have actually crossed. But they interact really well, very quickly with the endothelium. But in the cells that have reduced levels of CDC42, these cells stay round like this. And they sit in the capillaries, so they, they're probably physically trapped. So they can't, mechanically trapped, so they can't move forward immediately um, in, this, this, in this time frame. But they stay round and don't extend these protrusions. So that is um, quantified here. So at any time point, at the three time points we've looked at, there are always um, a lot more control cells that extend these protrusions compared to the ones lacking this protein CDC42. And um, that does affect their ability to stay in the lung. So over time, the number of cells go down very quickly. So at 10 minutes, you have lots of cells in the lung. At six hours, you have far fewer. And by 24 hours, you have maybe 1% of the ones that were there at, at 10 minutes. Um, but now we're looking at the relative proportion of the control cells versus the CDC42 knockdown. And, and the CDC42 depleted cells go down much faster than the control cells, which suggests that because they're just staying rounded, they're being washed away probably and, and detaching and going off much more easily than the, the normal cancer cells, the, the, the control cancer cells. So they might initially get trapped physically, but then they would move away. Now, um, the ultimate aim of this work is to see what, uh, whether stopping adhesion affects the ability of the cancer cells to form metastases. So in this, in this one, you inject the cell cancer cells into the tail vein. They go to the lung. The ones that survive and stay there can form metastases. Um, so they grow there, and um, you get these, and you can measure these after. So this is measured after six weeks. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but these these lungs have these nodules on the surface, which are the metastases, and these lungs, which receive the these receive the control cells, these receive the cells that have reduced CDC42 levels, and there are far fewer of these. But anyway, the graph shows you the difference. So we can count these, um, and uh, there are far fewer. Uh, when we've depleted CDC42. So that tells us that um, CDC42 is really important for the adhesion step and, and then for the subsequent ability of the cancer cells to spread um, in, the, in the blood vessels and in, at least in vitro to cross the blood vessel uh, wall. But the question is, what is CDC42 do, to doing? What's the key thing it's doing that um, prevents these processes. So um, what Nico did was to look at the cell surface receptors on the cancer cells and look at lots of different receptors that could be involved in this attachment phase because that's the very first phase that we're looking at. So I'm not going to show you all the negative results, but the one that was changed of all the ones he looked at was beta-1 integrin. So beta-1 integrin is, is known to be very important um, anyway for metastasis, but nobody's really pinpointed the step at which it acts. It could be multiple steps. So um, first of all, the most important thing is that the surface beta-1 integrin levels go down. So um, that's the amount actually on the surface of the cells because that's critical for them to attach. Um, and this is measured by... Um, using fluorescence, so we add an antibody to beta-1 integrin that's fluorescent, and then you measure the, the fluorescence of the cells. Um, and so what you see is this, these, this is a fluorescence of the control cells um, with beta-1 integrin antibody, and then this is reduced 
with CDs 42. This is a log scale, so it's actually quite a big difference. And, um, and this is quantified here, so the decrease is, um, is at least 50%. And then um, if we put, put back CDC42, then it goes back to normal. So it shows that it's really CDC42 that's affecting these levels. So sure enough, if we reduce the levels of beta-1 integrin using the same method of this RNAi to decrease the amount of beta-1 integrin on the cells, we can also see the same effect on the ability of the cells to um, sit into the endothelium. These are the control cells, and these are the beta-1 integrin knockdowns. They just stay on the surface and never sit down like this and spread um, between the endothelial cells. So beta-1 integrin is important for this step, and um, it's regulated by CDC42. Um, this is showing the same kind of data where we tra uh, uh, Nico tracked the cells and worked out when they were spreading between the endothelial cells. And again, the control cells, it goes up to nearly 100% by, by six hours. And the CDC42 depleted cells very strongly reduced. If he, he re-expressed, so we know that the beta-1 integrin levels are lower on these cells without CDC42. The beta-1 integrin levels are reduced. Uh, are, if we put back beta-1 integrin, so we re-express beta-1 integrin, so the levels are now back to normal, we can rescue this effect. So this is, these are these ones here. So it goes back up um, similarly to normal. So that would say that really what CDC42 is regulating is surface levels of beta-1 integrin, and this means the cells attach less and they can interact less uh, with the endothelial cells, and this really strongly inhibits the um, metastasis. Um, well, I'm sure he checked that. <laughs> you mean if it would just induce I mean we've got we've used the RNAi to deplete CD42 so it should stay down I would, I would be really surprised if it could stop the RNAi but I'm sure he would have done that as a control anyway to check the whole experiment was working okay so um so then the question is what at what level does CD42 act because um, there are multiple levels at which you could affect beta-1 integrin. You could affect um, transcription, so from the gene, or you could affect uh, translation from tra transcription to translation, so making the protein, or you could affect the protein getting to the surface. So it can be trapped, at, it could be stopped at multiple stages. So uh, Nico um, dissected all of this and found that, in fact, it may be affecting other stages, so I'm not ruling out other stages, but at least he could see that the CD42 reduction affected um, beta-1 integrin transcription. So the levels of the message for beta-1 integrin went down in the CD42 depleted cells. And then when you, when you artificially try and you take, basically take the region of beta-1 integrin gene that um, regulates... Uh, that regulates transcription, so upstream from the, the, the message. And you take that bit of DNA and you, you measure its activity artificially using uh, expression of something called luciferase, which makes, um, uh, can, um, but you can stimulate it to produce light. Um, so we can measure the activity of the, the bit of DNA called the promoter that um, makes the messenger and we found that CD42 stimulate. Uh, if we deplete CD42, this reduces the activity of this promoter region for the message. Um, I probably won't go through that in detail, but um, we, we found we found a transcription factor that would bind to the DNA so that we can get more message, and this is called SRF. Uh, it's a transcription factor that would normally bind to the beta one integrin promoter and stimulate transcription. So um, CD42 is regulating its transcription. And, and if we reduce the levels of this 
transcription factor, SRF, then we also reduce the levels of the beta-1 integrin protein, which is shown here. Okay, so the, the model that we've built up is that CDC42 is regulating the ability of cancer cells to cross the endothelium by regulating this transcription factor, SRF, which then induces a transcription, a beta-1 integrin message, which then gets made to protein and goes to the surface. <laughs> and finally, this uh, means that the cancer cells can't attach so well and cross as well, and this ultimately means you get less metastasis if you reduce this pr protein. So um, to summarize, at least for T cells, we know that this protein, rho A, is the most, is the most important from the 20 that we've looked at. Um, whereas for these prostate cancer cells, it's, it's not rho A. It's CDC42 uh, through this transcription factor and beta-1 integrin. Um, and I want to thank the people who've done the work. So the T-cell work was done by Sarah Heisman and Alvira Infante. And the prostate cancer work was nearly all done by Nico Raymond with help from Barbara Bordadagua and Ritter. And we were helped a lot by, uh, for the cancer model by um, Ruth Michelle's lab, um, Robert Grosser for B1 integrin transcription. Okay. Thank you.